Hey, what's good, everybody? This is Richard Thomas. And I'm Tiffany Thomas. And we are coming to you live from the Lionheart Institute podcast today. We are in our interview series, and I'm so excited to bring with you, bring to you one of my former ball players, one of the guys that I had an opportunity to break bread with, have relationship with, who was in the backfield with me at the University of Washington back in the 90s, was a great athlete, an outstanding young man um, in his own right in the day, but has become so much more as a young man. He is a remarkable story of victory and triumph, a young man who is making a difference um, not only in the standpoint of what he's doing for his family and those around him, but also what he's doing for our community. James Bible Man, welcome to the show, my friend. Thank you so much for having me, brother. It is an honor. It's been a long time since I've had a chance to uh, to chop it up with you. Um, you've done so much in the year since the UW. I, I, I'm a, I, I met, imagine that that's kind of like a foreign memory, right? Like a dream back in the day. Um, it, it do, yeah, it does feel like a different lifetime for sure. It's wild the way that we evolve and, and to hear what you're doing now, man, I'm so proud of you. Obviously, all of us as dogs, we uh, we went full hard, hardcore at it. Uh, you came in kind of as a transfer. I want you to share that story um, because we recruited you, stayed out of high school, but you took a detour um, and then came to us and you were kind of like me, if I remember correctly. Uh, yeah. You had to kind of do double duty. So here we were in tailback meetings. We were also in fullback meetings, which for our audience is kind of a glorified guard at the University right. of Washington. Uh, we were just a little prettier than some of those guys that put their <laughs> hand on the ground full time. But talk to me a little bit about where you're at now. Just share kind of the elevator ride with our audience, what you're doing now. And then I'd like to regress and kind of talk about your young your young life here in Washington and how it really got you to where you are now. So give us that elevator ride real quick, if you would. Absolutely. So at this time, I'm a civil and human rights attorney. I used to be the president of the NAACP out here, legal redress for the so NAACP so. for the states of Alaska, Oregon, and Washington. Um, what I do now is I represent people in police misconduct cases, sometimes in employment discrimination, sometimes in um, discrimination in classrooms um, related to disability, race, so many other issues I teach around this nation, wow. um, other attorneys, and I'm often consulted with some of the, uh, on some of the most, most high profile cases in this country related to wrongful death and police misconduct. Um, I represent a number of individuals in this state and others uh, whose families are, are heartbroken because they lost their loved ones as a direct result of uh, police violence. There's nothing quite like um, walking into a room um, and seeing someone's mother, their brother, their sister, their cousin, um, their uncle, everybody in the home, and they all just want the, the answer. Uh, they want to know why their loved one was killed. So powerful. Um, at the hands of law enforcement when uh, their expectation is protect and serve and protect and serve everybody and work towards a brighter day. So yeah. um, that's the type of work that I currently do. I also um, still work with people that are in poverty uh, in the criminal defense arena. I have a contract, uh, my firm has a contract to do public defense work with the county. Um, so I get to see a whole nother side of things yeah. in terms of um, how people get to the places where they are, what their experiences have been. Um, some of these folks I've actually known since they were tiny. Um, I have yeah. some remarkable stories of success, meaning success of the human beings that I've actually represented, where I've seen them come a, a tremendous distance. Um, a couple have even become lawyers. Uh, wow. A uh, mother, and I'll, I'll never forget this one, a mother who had lost four of her kids to CPS and oh, was gosh. pregnant at the time, who asked me to have faith in her uh, and just get her out. And she promised things would be different. Mm. Uh, and we were able to get her out. And frankly, I was scared that she would lose that baby, that something would happen. And I lost touch with her. Um, but about three or four years later, I was wandering through a, um, grocery store and I should should premise this with um, she had told me things would be different this time because there's this man 
and he's on my side and uh-huh. he's gonna stand with me. And these are things yeah. that honestly I hear all the time. So I'm like, yeah, it's your stumbling sure. blocks. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. That's, that's actually gonna be what's happening. But I'm walking through this grocery store about three or four years later, and this lady walks up to me, and there's a, a grocery cart, and there's a kid in the cart, and she starts talking to me about politics um, and different issues, and I'm listening to her, and I'm talking back to her. And there's a guy off to the side, and he's staring at me like he's ready to punch me in the face. Mm-hmm. This and is I'm his baby. Yeah. I'm looking at him like, are we going to go, man? Is that what's going to happen? Because she's talking to me. I am not talking. I'm just being respectful. And then finally she says to me, you don't remember me, do you? And I had to say, I'm sorry, but I don't. Mm-hmm. She looked completely different. She was in a wholly different space in her world. And she introduced me to her child. And she looked over at the man that was right next to her and said, this is the person that changed my world. Wow. That's powerful, and man. I'll never forget that because it, it puts people in a place where you, you have a different level of faith. And mm-hmm. he started to smile when he realized who I was. And he said, I'm sorry that I was looking at you like that, <laughs> but I will do anything to protect, protect her my, from going back. Wow. to where she was so until i knew exactly who you were that's how it was going to be yeah um so um there there are definitely uh some trials in this kind of work and i'm not just talking in the court i'm talking right. of the heart mm-hmm. um and and there's some successes but it's a an awesome place to be able to meet people who are in their most desperate circumstance and do whatever you can to help Man, I want to rewind and get to the early part of your life, but you're in such a good vein right now, James, that people people really that are watching are, from the word go are, are deeply engrossed. I've got two questions for you. You're based in the Northwest, right? So Seattle, correct? Alaska. You, you're talking about your your previous work with the NAACP. That's Who, right. Many people would say, "Hey, racism certainly, police brutality." in the the northwest is not that significant to where there would even be a need for a voice Mm -hmm. like yours well and and that's what's interesting and i I have to tell people that the level and type of racism that is in washington state alaska and oregon i hope never gets um exported to Mm -hmm. other states because it is trickier it's sophisticated it's deeply rooted it's highly skilled it's Um, powerful and and intricate and I, i can tell you that my grandma, grandfather was from Mississippi. Mm-hmm. Uh, he came up to Seattle, Washington after World War II, went to UW in the uh, 19, like the start, I want to say 1950, right? Wow. Um, <laughs> That's a different experience. Isn't it? Because <laughs> there weren't many of us there, if any of us. Mm-hmm. I, I looked at his yearbook and saw maybe three. Um, And I tell folks that he had to come to Seattle, Washington to have a cross burned on his front yard. He married a Swedish woman. Uh, They lived in the U district at the time. You, if you were a person of color, if you were black, you couldn't be in a space where you actually lived on that side of the Montlake bridge. Mm -hmm. Um, There was redlining. Um, His wife actually bought the place and He lived in the place with her. Mm -hmm. They were upset that a black person had got in there. They were even more upset. Exactly. Uh, Even more upset when they started renting rooms to other minorities on that (laughs) side uh, of the bridge. You Mm -hmm. know, Um, redlining was remarkable here. Segregation is still remarkable here in the 1980s. um, One of the last school segregation cases actually involves the Seattle public schools. Um, incarceration here in terms of disproportionalities at times have has rivaled the state of Mississippi Uh, Wow! if you were to go into the courtrooms of the King County Superior Court in criminal cases you would think that King County was predominantly black Mm -hmm. that is a harsh reality Um, so this is exactly a place where we need to be dealing with uh, inequities and injustice and um, bringing light to it, along with other spaces as well around the country. Mm -hmm. Um, The truth is uh, racism is real in every part of this country, in every space, and we have to be perpetually ready to deal with it. You know, it's really interesting because 
I, you know, I grew up in Washington most of my life. I, I did live a few places down south throughout the years as well. But, you know, if you were to ask me, I would tell people Washington is one of the most, most diverse places in the Northwest, very accepting of different races and cultures and, uh, you know, different colors. And, it, you know, what you just said is so complete opposite, I think, of what people think about when they think of Washington and they think of that here. And it's, so it's very surprising to hear you talk about how that's really kind of the opposite happening here. And I know Richard and I have talked about this in some of our other podcasts as well, but just with everything with the election and kind of really seeing true racism come out and bigotry and hate from people that we've talked to just here in Washington was very eye-opening as well. And I felt that, that, that there was just a lot of kind of hidden racists that weren't really coming out in full force yet, just kind of kept their opinions to themselves. And now um, with everything going on, they feel very comfortable being able to express that openly a lot more so than they used to be. And it was very shocking to me to see the amount of racism that was being spewed out. So, you know, it's, it's, you don't really think of it being in your backyard, especially here in this state. So it's, it's pretty incredible to hear you talk about how significant it actually is. Right. It, it's something that's uh, shocking and traumatizing, though when it's more overt, you can deal with right. it differently than when mm -hmm. um, right. it moves in silence and it smiles at you and then behind your back does all kinds of things that impacts your ability to succeed, succeed and or thrive in life. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I occasionally point out to people about Seattle specifically is within its borders, um, the the zip code 98118, uh, according to U.S. Census Bureau statistics, is the most diverse uh, zip code in the entire nation. Powerful. Now, this is proof of absolute segregation, mm -hmm. because yeah. in, a sa in a town that is um, predominantly white, like Seattle currently is, it's almost impossible to have any environment that is that concentrated of a diverse population without having some sort of walls or borders that prevent you from living in other parts of the city. That would push um, so, you that direction so yeah. aggressively. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really sophisticated in nature uh, how that's actually done. And, and ultimately minorities, many of them are pushed um, to wherever is the least desirable plot of land. And you're seeing that now. Um, that Yesler and other areas are now deemed desirable. Mm -hmm. So there, there's a lot to think about within it. Um, absolutely. We, we started, I, I know that you're obviously familiar with uh, J.J. Hansen and mm -hmm. Damon Barry, but when we were in college, we started an organization called Race Relations 2000. And uh, we started doing school assemblies as early as, as my sophomore year i believe it was in high school and we would do them around the community did them you know at different high schools and so forth and just the amount of covert racism that began to reveal itself uh was shocking even to me who grew up in los angeles and moved to uh, kent washington you know where right. i moved when i moved to kent washington the only thing black in the neighborhood was black angus cow that was about <laughs> it and uh you know the way that i was treated interaction right. with police officers and so forth now i was fortunate because uh, i had a very sophisticated understanding of inter inter interaction with police officers growing right. up in los angeles however there were many situations to where if i wouldn't have been an athlete it would have gone an entirely different direction, but one of the officers would happen to know, oh, you play at such and such. You're the right. new tailback in the area. The other thing you said, and I, I hope to get back to this topic, but the other thing you said is that you work with so many high-profile cases all around the country, which is outstanding because I know the depth of work you're doing, the difference that you're making, and then you contrasted it with coming back, the, the, the poor mom who really has no other representation here in Seattle. That's, right. That's two sides of, of, of the same coin, right? We have the high profile case that, well, I'll use the term African Americans are on display. Our lives are being ripped apart from the standpoint of analyzed from birth all the way through junior high, really elementary, junior high, high school, trying to find any chink in our armor to what really initiated this event with the police officer that cost us our life. 
you're involved in those kind of cases and then you're involved in cases that nobody would ever open up and see in the paper yet you've made the choice to go back and do that where does that come from in your personality that would really drive you to do that and how how big of a difference is are those two cases to you I, I, they're all of equal importance. I, I, um, I uh, grew up in a particular way with, in a particular community with uh, folks that had gotten in trouble and all of those sorts of things. And it mm-hmm. kind of led me into a different space. And ultimately what I learned is that there's not much difference between uh, somebody that dies on the street corner and some, somebody that becomes a lawyer. Uh, I learned that from my own experience in terms of um, one of my brothers who got shot and killed, uh, who was brilliant and a genius, um, and then myself. And and I think that that is a reality that I think about. And I think about um, other times in my life when people that had almost nothing did everything they could to help me. And sometimes I see them sitting in jail today and now and I know more about their life experience and how they got to where they did um, than any prosecutor or even court or system Mm -hmm. would know and um, ultimately it comes down to human value and when I take those cases uh, they're the most meaningful to me because it's an opportunity to get somebody into a different sort of space in their world if we're lucky yeah Um, and uh, sometimes we're successful with that. So uh, I'm very proud of the things that that we do when really nobody's looking. Mm-hmm. And that's really what yeah. they call integrity, right? Is what you do when no one is watching, right? That is the distance. You and know, that is that is the thing that we try to do. I grew up with so many guys. They they would they would really almost prophesy to us, "Hey, by the time you're 18 or in your early 20s." you'll be dead or in jail, you'll be dead and in jail, you'll be dead or in jail, or you'll be a musician, you'll be dead or in jail, you'll be an athlete, you'll be dead or in jail. And they predetermined these courses for us uh, so early from the time we're, you know, little um, to where what you're saying is so very powerful. It's just that small adjustment that can make all the difference in the world. And I'm proud of you, James, for making that, that understanding and making that adjustment because that's truly what makes the biggest difference. We have sisters like Candace Owens, and uh, I I would assume you're aware of her. Um, Oh yeah. And uh, I I honor her as a black woman or a Caribbean um, Mm -hmm. black woman. Um, I, you know, I esteem her for the work she's doing in the sense of of driving to be better herself. Mm -hmm. Um, But we have her saying just nonsense things like, African-American community is the only community that elevates and deifies the worst of us. What do you say to that? Because obviously there is a degree of, even in my own story, where I'll look at gangbangers I grew up with and, you know, I'll I'll look at the life they lived and the life they chose and the decisions they would make to put me out of the car when they were going to do work so that I would have a future and a hope because I was an outstanding athlete. Um, but they made choices that were not healthy, but there was nobody there to make a difference for them, like like yourself. What do you say to a Candace Owens, or not necessarily, necessarily her, but just that whole mindset that we deify the worst of us, what we would esteem as the worst of us, and really don't try to elevate? What are your thoughts that way? I would say ultimately that we have to respect the resilience of black people in this nation. Uh, that we are in a space where we are survivors, where we found ways to raise our families, take care of our kids, where we've um, ended up in unorthodox places and taken what some have called prison, uh, prison penitentiary chances um, when there were no other opportunities. And some people end up locked up and up against walls when they haven't done anything wrong at all. Um, some Earth. people end up in prison in the same way, and it's an, an an issue of finding opportunity. So we give tribute to survival Mm -hmm. um, when you are a black person under these particular circumstances. And frankly, a lot of people, um, including white folks, look at outlaws with some amount of admiration. And that's something that might need to be addressed and evaluated in our society. But in terms of um, the black population, um, the black population is one of love. And some of those people that uh, 
she's dem demonized as not being good um, because of whatever they may have done are also some of the first people to make sure that people in their family are fed, um, that people so powerful, are warm, man. that people are clothed, that um, they give away everything they can in order to actually help. So um, it's not as simple as saying one person is bad and one put person is good. The analysis mm -hmm. is is so much deeper than that. Um, I wouldn't be a lawyer um, without some folks in my life that haven't made the best decisions that they could have in the world. And right. that, that's a reality. Um, folks that occasionally stood up for me in different ways and said, much like you, brother, we can't have you here right now. Yeah, you can't do to go. this. <laughs> you got to go over there. Right. You know, all of those sorts of things that that I think were important. And I can reflect back to being a 14 year old kid walking on the AF um, with two other African-American friends um, that had never really ever gotten in trouble for any of us. We went to this video game place called Arnold's. I don't know if you remember. No, I know Arnold's well. Oh, yeah, Arnold. <laughs> and, and we were just having fun. And we're, we're all kids uh, that, frankly, had been recruited by Bellevue High School to be out there. So we were out in Bellevue. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess I can say that now because it's decades later. Yeah, um, they've, ch they've changed their ways. They've changed their ways. <laughs> Though I wasn't necessarily mad at them then because no. it created tremendous opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but we were just walking down the street when we got put up against wall by police officers. And when we got put up against the, the wall by police officers, the officers accused us of, of jaywalking. And we said, but we haven't done jaywalked. We didn't do that. We were with, within the lines and we looked at this man and we realized, you know, ultimately, it doesn't matter what we say, mm -hmm. you know, and then they started quizzing us about why were we running from them and we weren't running from them at all. And it, it got to this. You weren't even walking place. fast. Exactly. <laughs> um, but this other brother that I knew um, that was relatively close to our age saw us, smiled and walked up and started talking trash to the officers. They dealt more with him because he'd been in trouble before. Mm -hmm. And we ended up walking away because they had whoever they wanted to talk to. They right? had the, they had their case, right? They had their case. They had their catch for the night or whatever you want to call it. They had it, mm -hmm. you know, um, and that same person I occasionally see in the King County jail right now. And every time I see him, he's like, hey, James, how you doing? It's good to see that you're doing well, man. And all of this stuff. And it's just like, wow. I remember that moment in time right there where things could have gone a lot different for me because I thought right. I was going to go to cuff, get cuffed. Now, I will tell you this. I did get a jaywalking ticket in the mail <laughs> <laughs> for that incident. This is a true story. That actually happened. Wow. And then I had to go to Seattle Central Community College for a serious <laughs> offenders class. This actually mm. happened. And so Man. as I go to this serious offenders class, I go in, I sit in the back. I had to pay like 15 bucks. It was like 1986 or 87 or something. I'm sitting there. Um, and each kid has to stand up and talk about what they, what they did to get there. And everybody's talking about how they like either got out of, just got out of juvenile prison for like, one was like part of a drive-by shooting or something. Another like <laughs> did a hit and run. Somebody tried, was a getaway driver in a burglary. Oh and I was gosh. like, oh wow, this is all related to cars, but this isn't gonna go well for me because I'm the only jaywalker up in here. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. So now I know why you were shy in college. Please understand, it wasn't just in college because in high school I had literally stopped talking. I did not I know talk you. For after, after this for like four years, <laughs> oh and that gosh. lasted all the way through college. I know, like, that's right. It, it was really like, I'm done. Um, that's terrible. So I'm sitting, in, I'm sitting in this classroom, and I finally I stand up, and the teacher's looking at me, and I'm like, I got to admit to you, I will do this again. And every kid looked at me like, wow, this is the tough, toughest brother in the room. He's not even trying to lie. He's not even trying to hide it. And I looked at him and said, I'm what you might even call incorrigible. And everybody was like, oh, no, public enemy number, number one. one. Right That's there. right. And I was like, in fact, I will do it as soon as I leave here today. Oh, my God. 
and the teacher's looking at it like if he had a panic button, he was gonna, He's ready for it. He was gonna push the panic button. And then I said, that's right, I jaywalked and I'll do it again. And the oh my gosh. whole class just Lost cracked it. up. The teacher looked at me like I was like irresponsible, not taking being, taking this seriously. And he, he told me all about it. And then he looked at his list and he said, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm not sure why you're here and you have to go through this class. <laughs> But you do. <laughs> so I go through this class. Um, I go through it. I go to high school. I go to college. I graduate. I'm applying for jobs. Man. I apply for a job as a counselor in a juvenile correctional facility because I felt like I could really help kids. Right. It was in Whatcom County. I felt like I could I could be the difference. I had been a camp counselor for YMCA's for like five years all the way through uh, college. Those were the things that I loved. To right. Do. And won so, a, almost won a national championship at Western, if I remember correctly. Part, part, I hate that word almost. But right. <laughs> but no, part of a, almost part of, sets part, me off, bro. I, shoot, I almost won three of them. So, you this, know. Is true. this is true. This is true. This is right. This is right. This so is, you can make a difference in these young people's lives. And, and yeah. go ahead. Yeah, all the all that experience, all the thing, all the things that I've seen when I I've growing up, and I'm sure we'll come back to that. Um, and I apply for the job, and I'm like one of the finalists. And there's just this one thing, the criminal background check, and um, something pops up. I didn't know it, but apparently right. something popped up. And the only reason that I later knew it is because my cousin. One of my cousins actually worked in Whatcom County and she is very Swedish and she <laughs> knew the manager of the detention center and was like, I know that boy hasn't been in trouble. I need you to just do an extra double check. Mm -hmm. Right. And they looked into it and it was that jaywalking ticket. It had been nice. registered as what's called a Juvis number. And a Juvis oh number is for when somebody, it's like a tracking number in the state, Washington state. And it tracks you on through as if you had like committed some sort of serious crime. Mm -hmm. um, so I almost didn't get my first job out of college over a jaywalking incident when I did not jaywalk when I was 14 years old. As a minor. Oh my God. As a minor, as a child who didn't jaywalk, who had to make very grown up decisions up against a wall to not respond when your heart is hurting so bad because right. you know that you're being dehumanized at the moment. Mm -hmm. So powerful. Talk about, before we get back to your childhood, talk about getting on paper for a minute. Uh, I'm sure that's a term you've heard. It's a term they just obviously did to you. I heard a TED talk one time not long ago from a professor. It was very powerful. Wrote a book on being, um, a, a book on the Black Panthers. He uh, tells a very powerful story. Google it or, or YouTube it, whatever it is, and you'll find it. Um, but the, the professor wrote a book, um, was bringing those books to someone, um, had rented a car, and then decided to fly back. And so he's flying back, and in the process, they find all these Black Panther books. And so they pull them off the plane, do a deep investigation of them. FBI comes and is called, well... Uh, Ten, I'll call it 10 years. I don't know what the real story is, so so look mm -hmm. it up. But um, audience, please check it out. I'll try to find it and put a link in the, in the description. Um, but he ends up being uh, fired or nearly fired from his job. Because at the university he was working at. At the university yeah. he was working at because he had a felony count <laughs> um, against him or some type of a warrant against him based mm -hmm. on the FBI. Just put it on his, on his paperwork. Um, and... Uh, they uh, basically tried to throw him, throw him, fire him. He ended up getting it expunged and so forth. But so many young men get their name in the system and then they're essentially trapped in a lifestyle. How often does that happen? How, what, are, what, are, what are some rough percentages or experiences that you know of? And how can a young man who, who wasn't in your situation, you, you didn't even make a mistake, but they made a mistake in their early years and now those things are, are haunting them. Is there anything they can do to change that, that paperwork? Or, or what are they really committed to? 
Uh, you're touching on an issue that is uh, ever present in our society in terms of redemption and the opportunity to be the best that you can be. Mm -hmm. uh, and unfortunately, in a lot of circumstances, we get in the way of folks being able to be the best they can be by holding all of their past against them and not Man. creating a real path towards rede to redemption. Mm -hmm. um, it is very difficult once you are on what so many people call paper. Um, your whole entire life, your world is scrutinized in such a way where you're deemed the enemy. Um, you're deemed somebody that doesn't get pr to participate in the political process. You don't get to vote. Um, people are hesitant to put you in a space where you can live in, a, in an apartment uh, and many jobs you're not able to get um, even when whatever they claim you did or whatever you did mm -hmm. um, is unrelated to whether or not you would be capable of such work. Um, there are means on occasion of expungement. There are also opportunities to um, <clears throat> to go before the governor on occasion for clemency, mm -hmm. um, but the overwhelming percentage of cases never reach that sort of place. And also there's a lot of technical errors that do occur in the system that folks never really ever get to know about um, that impact their ability to grow and breathe and be the best they could possibly be. Um, and the system is, an unforgiving one, um, even when people are later deemed innocent. I, I've represented a man named Gerald Hankerson. Uh, he was sentenced as an 18 year old in Washington state um, to oh life God. without the possibility of parole at age 18. Uh, oh at the time that he was sentenced, convicted and sentenced, um, the prosecutor wrote to his attorney give us five reasons why he shouldn't get the death penalty. None of those reasons involved actual innocence. I met Gerald when he was, I want to say, 38 years old, sitting in a prison because somebody else that I had worked with that had actually been given an opportunity to grow and be something else who had been in prison said, we need to, you need to meet him, James. You need to just meet this person. Mm -hmm. um, he's a remarkable person. You just got to see him and you'll believe. Um, and so I said, okay, we'll go out and we'll meet him. We set up a time to go meet him. Uh, I'll never forget it because we're driving in our car out to Aberdeen, Washington, Clallam yes. Bay Prison. And it starts to snow and it starts to snow really bad. And um, each, every like 10 minutes, we're like, should we turn around? And we're like, no, we've come too far now. Should we turn around? No, we've come too far now. And eventually we get there, right? And I planned on just having a 30 to 45 minute conversation. Yes, sir. With him. And then turning around, that conversation ended up being about three and a half to four hours long. Um, and I walked away convinced that he was innocent, convinced that he had spent most of his life in prison, all of his adult life in prison for an act that he did not commit. So we started to investigate it. And I was sitting because um, at th that time I was still working for the public defender's office. I was sitting in a, a staff meeting and a name popped up of this person that some other attorneys were going to go visit in Missouri, right? Mm -hmm. And they were going to go visit this person in a prison in Missouri um, because he was a potential witness in a case. And um, this person that they were visiting had, sh had been a witness at three separate homicides and cut deals mm -hmm. and was in prison in Missouri for having shot a police officer that lived and survived to tell the tale as to who did it. Wow. And I looked at the name and I said, I recognize that name from Gerald's case. And I went back and I looked at Gerald's case and sure enough, that was the man that was standing in the, a pool of blood, drinking a soda from the dead man that got a deal to testify against Gerald. Wow sure as can be. And then we delved deeper and um, there was a co-defendant in Gerald's case and that co-defendant committed suicide while in prison and left a note saying that Gerald Hankerson had nothing to do with it. Wow. <laughs> we delved deeper and at that time I started dealing with the governor and the governor's counselor and we started to go through the entire case 
and all the case files and all the transcripts and we saw such remarkable errors it was really incredible mm -hmm. it was it was just like nothing i had actually seen um and i got to know gerald's story and how he got to seattle from from georgia because he came up here to find his mother right and uh how he ended up realizing that that she was in a very difficult space and there was a reason why she wasn't necessarily at that time prepared to be able to raise him mm -hmm. um the way he had hoped and uh he was new in the cd and because he was new in the cd folks pointed the finger at him as the one that did it right when he wasn't and he sat there but his story is a remarkable one because after talking to him it wasn't just that he was innocent it was that he did so many amazing things while in prison he started uh he he didn't start but he became the president of what's called the black prisoners caucus and then from there since he was doing life he announced that he wanted to be able to go to school um go to college get some training do all these different programs but the only pro problem was that those programs were reserved for this group called the lifers mm -hmm. and the lifers were actually run by the Aryan nations. And there were very clear lines about who joins what, who can be a part of what, what mm -hmm. lines can actually be crossed. And he said, I want to do it anyway. <laughs> and all the brother, all the, the people in the air, the Aryans went to the brothers and said, please tell Gerald that he can't do this. <laughs> please tell these they call them nine in there please tell nine no this is not something we do we don't cross this, this is unnecessary yeah mm -hmm. and gerald said i'm gonna do this anyway right and then at some point a box of store-bought knives were found in the kitchen um that were smuggled into the prison and those knives were for gerald <sighs> they were for gerald they were going to the Aryans were going to cause serious harm to him for his attempt to try to cross that line that educational line that's right and so Talk the brothers in the prison were like well we have our lines and our things that we can't cross but we can't let them just stab him so they're taking uh cans of suit suit old soup cans and they're sharpening them out in the yard this was almost the biggest prison riot in the history of the state of mm -hmm. washington until ministers that knew both sides intervened ministers from the outside that convinced the lifers to let gerald in i don't want to interrupt your story but if i could get one minister two ministers three ministers on the outside to fight for for young men of color young women of color to get some education like that it would change our state completely yeah. completely it would because gerald became president of the lifers too Wow. And now on occasion, he, he sure did. And now, on occasion, and now on occasion, when you go into a black prisoners caucus meeting, you see a white man with a swastika on his arm <laughs> who's decided that something should be different in his life. Mm -hmm. wow. And so with Gerald's 20 years, 22 years in prison, um, he did some remarkable things. But I bring all of this up because when dealing with the governor, when dealing with the King County prosecutor, when talking about why he should be released, they were all focused as well on, oh, well, he's made remarkably positive changes in his world and didn't want to deal with the actual innocence factor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I had to say, you got to wonder if our prison systems actually raised a Gerald Hankerson or if Gerald actually found a way to be who he was and build up as many people as he possibly could. Mm -hmm. you in know, the you, end they they wrote a letter clemency was granted they wrote a letter um say to the governor saying we now recognize that there are mitigating circumstances that um so give us a different perception of what the co level of culpability is that mr hankerson had so without representing that we made a mistake mm -hmm. right. they said please just let him out gerald hankerson is now president of the Alaska, Oregon, and Washington State Conference NAACP. So powerful. Wow. That's where he is right now at this moment. He was my replacement at the King County NAACP, and I tell people I had to go to prison to find the person that was capable of leading the NAACP. 
So wow. um, there is no limit to the amount of redemption that, that we need to push for, the amount of opportunity that we need to help people build and grow into. And we got to find ways to get people off of paper. And even if they never get off of paper, we have to find ways to make sure that society deems them as valuable and yeah. that they still have a chance to be great. You know, something I really saw this summer um, with all the police shootings and all the deaths that happened this year um, was, it, you know, I'm just going to be really frank because the white community does not seem to believe in redemption for people of color. Right. It's very apparent in how people responded to these shootings. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the first thing they do is break out the checklist of all the things they've done wrong in their lives. You know, right. and my first thought is, but they served their time, right? They they did what they needed to do. Why are you holding that against them? And even so, it still doesn't justify these people being murdered by any means. And it, it really shocked me how little forgiveness people had. And, you know, it just truly amazed me when I saw that come out of people this year and how... They just keep holding the past sins and past transgressions against people of color. And, it, and I, I said to them, well, how do you ever expect a community to rise and people to make changes that need to be to, to happen if you are never going to let them? Because you're always going to constantly remind them of all their, their transgressions and their sins and the things they've done wrong. But yet you are constantly condemning them for not rising and making changes, but you're not giving them the opportunity to do that because you're always saying, well, they don't deserve redemption because they've messed up. And I, I you know, that was really eye opening for me because I, I never saw it from that perspective before of how difficult it is for a lot of people in black communities to be able to get past that when people are constantly holding it over their heads. It, while, on, it, while on the flip side, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but while on the flip side saying, why are you still bringing up slavery? Right. Why are you still bringing up red right. Why are exactly. you still bringing up um, educational segregation? Um, so that's powerful. Yeah. yeah. Please, please address that because a lot of times we're judged for trying to bring hate or a message of hate. Right. We're judged and they say, hey, why don't you let things go? Mm -hmm. But there is that element of non-forgiveness that you deal with on a daily basis where they're not redeemable. Right. Um, and it's not a message of hate that we want to bring. It's a message of love, love for our own people, of course, right. as well. But not not, right. not a message of hate towards Caucasians or white people by any means. It's a message of love and hope and restoration mm -hmm. that we can all grow together. But we have to make that effort. And so that'll be my follow-up question so you can have that run in your back mm -hmm. of your mind. Yes, we need BLM movements for these mass events that are insane and I hope you'll bring up a case that is not getting the attention it deserves. It, it does deserve the same energy as a George mm -hmm. Floyd as, as Breonna right. Taylor right. Um, here in our own community. Yeah. But we also need to march for education. Yeah. We also need to march for the development of health care for, for women of color who die at such a high disproportionate amount in contrast to Caucasian women at childbirth. Yeah. Why are these things not addressed in an aggressive way? So please do address that in the sense of of our our love for ourselves and our love for our community does not equate to to white hate. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I, I certainly love my black community and I love my multicultural community as well. I um, I I speak out now, I speak out often, and I speak out loudly principally because I do have hope for our society. So if good. I didn't have hope for society, I wouldn't be speaking out in this way. I wouldn't be sharing how I feel. I just hope that it doesn't end up on deaf ears. It's not a message of hate. If it were a message of hate, I'd keep it to myself, mm -hmm. move my own direction, work my job, stay within my house, and just peer out and say, look at them all going crazy. That's powerful. Um, you know, but the reality is that when we speak, we're speaking in such a way where we hope that we're heard, we hope that we're understood, and we hope that we're, we're loved. It's when we stop speaking um, that we all have to have some amount of actual concern. When we stop sharing, this is how we feel about 
um, society and our experience that it's there's powerful. a question in relation to whether or not we actually love all people. Yeah. Um, and so I'm hopeful. And every time I speak, I'm not just speaking to black people. I'm speaking to people that can make a difference and a change in mm -hmm. um, our circumstances. And the change reality is, so is that this nation um, in recent months has been forced to sit back and reflect. And it's not just because of what happened with George Floyd. It's because we were in our houses placed in a space where we weren't yeah. running off to work. It wasn't mm -hmm. like when George Floyd came out, <clears throat> it wasn't a situation where somebody's watching it on Channel 7, drinking some coffee real quick and then saying, well, that's awful and running off to work. Right. They had to sit and reflect on that for days days mm -hmm. yeah. and when you sit and you reflect on it for days and you hear him call for his mama you start yeah. to think about well what about all the others and yeah. that's what led to um at least for a brief period of time an enlightenment in this nation that brought all people out into the streets not just black people not just other people of color but white folks as well in the streets saying this is enough because there's something that damaged our soul seeing a man executed like that yeah so, uh, and it's present everywhere i'll tell you i was um in the hospital in may for about five days mm -hmm. i was in the hospital with ivs in my arm when i saw George Floyd for the first time. I was in a space where I was forced to take a step back, reflect, and pay attention to things differently mm -hmm. myself, though I had always, or for many, about two decades now, been in this struggle for, um, at least on the legal side, equity, equality, civil rights. Um, fairness in healthcare and education and all of those things. Um, <clears throat> and it was daunting to watch the image over and over and over yeah. again. It was daunting to start fielding the calls from other attorneys that started to work on the matter, that specific matter and medical examiners and, and the like. And then I got a call from this, this um, lady named Monet. She is the sister of Manuel Ellis. And I was sitting in the hospital and I was telling her, you know, my soul is tired. I'm tired. I'm mm -hmm. sorry. I'm, I'm, um, I have to recover. I have to be ready to take care of my seven year old. I got to focus on my health. Um, and I just listened to her and her story and said, I promise you, as soon as I get out of this hospital bed, though, I'm going to research and I'm going to investigate this. And we started with a um, we started with uh, just a, an echo on a radio scanner that said, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. Um, and we didn't know what that would grow into. And that was all that we had. But we started to conduct investigation. We started to cast a wider net. Uh, we had a press conference and we started to search for witnesses and we found three separate witnesses, all of whom say the officers just jumped out of their car and choked this man and tased him to death. Um, we found <clears throat> three separate videos, um, all of which showed how he was beaten in different ways and tased and choked. And then we found a ring video that had audio to it. And we learned that Manuel's Ellis's last words were, I can't breathe, sir. Plain as day, I can't breathe, sir. His last words oh, on God. this planet were a show of respect to officers that were taking his life. We forced the medical, the medical examiner finally released their report and it said homicide. Wow. death by restraint and this is uh, please understand at the start of this case the officers described it as excited delirium mm -hmm. they said he was high on meth and there might be some medical reasons in relation to any sort of substance that might mask meth that we'll be dealing with in the courtroom 
um, said that he was high on meth, that he was experiencing excited delirium, which is something that officers regularly claim mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. folks that are in uh, a state where they end up killing them. They say they had super strength and all of this stuff. It's not a real actual diagnosis. It's not right. recognized by the medical profession. Um, and they murdered him. Um, and right now we're forced, we forced them into an investigation by the state. And I've sat there which eat with each and every witness as the state interviews them. And they're telling the same exact story that they've always told. The physical evidence is always there. And based on my experience in the criminal law, anytime you even had one witness to something that happened like this, mm -hmm. the cops would already be prosecuted, mm -hmm. would right. already be prosecuted for homicide, but they're not there yet. But we hope we're gonna get there, but we're not slowing down. Mm -hmm. And this will be the first time that I speak about this publicly. We'll be speaking about it more next week and releasing it. It's but powerful. we have uh, something in the works called the Manuel Ellis Washington Anti-Discrimination Act. Come on, man. And we believe that we have all the support for that. And here's what this act does. It not only focuses on officers that choke human beings to death, it also focuses on equity and equality in education, equity and equality in so uh, vaccines, equity and equality in healthcare, equity and equality in general. It is an anti-discrimination act. It is a pro-equality act. On, it is a move that needs to happen across the nation in terms of us proactively addressing the situations that put human beings in a place where we're Change not able so to powerful. live up, live up to that that dynamic claim that this country creates opportunities for all people. It's time to make that real. So, with Manuel Ellis and honoring him, we're trying to address some of those things that that aren't always as popular to so talk powerful. about with healthcare, education, mm -hmm. opportunities, mm -hmm. the daily work, right? The daily stuff that makes sure that the kid in the back room, in the back corner, child number 34 or 35 in the classroom gets that yeah. equal treatment, that opportunity, the room to grow, the room to breathe, hugs and gets to be told that he's special, even if his yeah. parents aren't in a place where they can tell him or her exactly that. And let's make it happen. Um, so the Manuel Ellis Washington Anti-Discrimination Act is on its way Come we're collecting so signatures good. right now we've been all over the we've had folks all over this state and and uh it's funny because with this we've been moving in silence yeah we have marched we've rallied we've spoken we've done all of those things but i don't think that the system anticipated that we'd be moving in this way too but right. we are we are is there a website that if someone's listening they want to sign the petition they can go to We'll be releasing that on Wednesday next week. Okay. And yeah. just and and for our viewers because they live all over the United States, um, I, I want just to tell a little bit about this case. This was here in Tacoma, Washington, where this gentleman was murdered by these cops. And you know the sad thing is it didn't get a lot of time in the air. A lot of people don't even know who this man is. And you know, especially people who don't live in Washington. And the sad part is he is one of many that you're right. not that you're not going to see all over the news or not going to be these big riots over and protest over. But he is one of many that stories that need to be heard and need to be shared and need justice. And just because you don't see it on TV does not mean it's not happening every day in every state. That's right. And, and we have text messages from these particular officers to other officers, and they're unbelievable. Mm -hmm. One officer um, that wasn't a part of it sent these, this group of officers a text message saying, you guys are studs. The whole <laughs> second floor backs you. And we had to look into... We had to look into who that officer was, mm -hmm. that officer that sent the message. And then we learned that he had actually shot two human beings during his career as well. Um, one who died and another who lived. And with the one who lived, um, as the person was crying out in pain, and excuse my language, he told him to shut the fuck up. Jeez. Unbelievable. Disgusting. He sure did. 
Um, and captured in the Manuel Ellis video that we have after he is told he can't breathe, sir, are the words, shut the fuck up. <laughs> and we're sure that comes from one of those officers. So wow. it's an amazing sort of trend all from the Tacoma Police Department um, who at that stage had no, no in-car dash video, no body camera videos, no um, quality assurance mechanism to monitor them. We are just blessed and thankful that there happened to be, first of all, a lady that jumped out of her car and said, stop it just arrest him she didn't know what was going on so she said mm -hmm. just arrest him you don't have to do this and was yelling right. and screaming and was was filming um and then her baby's dad jumped out of the car behind and she's screaming at him to get back in the car because she doesn't want them to come after him and he's got right. the kids in their car and then a guy that's delivering pizza who sees it from a whole nother angle and pauses and is shocked and then starts to film it himself um to tell manuel ellis's story but here's the the crazy thing about that when asked when these three people asked how come they didn't come forward sooner mm -hmm. they said because they didn't think that what they saw was related to manuel ellis because the story that they were originally told in the papers for three months before we got on this case was that he was a dangerous drug addict that was banging on the police car and doing all kinds wow. of things that they just didn't see that's crazy so they used the out of sight you don't know what happened before this right. event absolutely. absolutely and at what point does it matter what point at what point if you're a police officer does it even matter if he tried to knock you out if he tried to cause you harm once you have him arrested subdued he is no longer resisting. All you're yeah. supposed to do is arrest this man. Right. And, and that that's absolutely true. And in my capacity as a corrections officer, frankly, I've had to use force before. Right. And have an understanding of what it's like to be in that space. And I've never been in that 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 realm where I felt like somebody with that just had their hands and I had my hands. I had to do anything remotely like that to mm -hmm. them. Um The reality is that we have courtrooms for a reason and we shouldn't have an archaic system that allows for that level or magnitude of violence so to get well in said. the way of our constitutional process. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, the 2000s. This isn't the 1500s. Yeah. Um, uh, we should have better technology and we should have the ability to bring people into custody um, without harming them so that a court can decide. Uh, but frankly, uh, a white kid can go into a church and kill mm -hmm. nine people and so drive awesome. away and be fed a cheeseburger, yeah. drink and fries and ask yeah. if he's comfortable as mm -hmm. they're arresting him. Yeah. Uh, and that's not an isolated incident or and you compare it to an African-American woman down in Texas that's in her own home playing video games with uh, her younger relative while babysitting and an officer shoots her through the window because he thinks she's a burglar in her own house. Yeah. Um, or Breonna Taylor in uh, Louisville, Kentucky with officers storming into her house while she's working as a first responder and then they shoot and they kill her. Yeah. Um, this is a, a, a harsh reality and degradation of the human body um, and specifically black bodies in this country, but it speaks to how little we value um, people with this skin and the perceptions that so we've far. created in reference to who black people must be. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's difficult to walk down the street at times as a black person, you gotta think about, okay, well, here's this white lady about a half a block in front of me. If I speed up and I'm trying to pass her, is she going to be afraid of me? Is she going to scream? Is she going to call the police? Mm -hmm. If I'm by myself, are they going to make an assumption that I've actually done something wrong? Mm -hmm. um, if somebody else has maybe done something wrong. I mean, I've been surrounded. Once again, another high school story. I have been surrounded while in my Wendy's restaurant uniform <laughs> by police officers and accused of a 
burglary that was three miles away and 10 minutes earlier. And it impacted my ability to get work. And my family, frankly, we needed that money. I wasn't working just Mm. because it was fun. I was working because if we need to pay a bill, I'm 16 years old and I got to help. And I remember the manager at the Wendy's staring out of the drive through like we knew it. We knew it. We knew he did did something wrong. Oh, and, my God. And they eventually, like, let me go after I was surrounded. Mm-hmm. Um, but my hours sure did get cut the next week and cut mm-hmm. even more the week after that. And essentially, I was phased out. And I know that's the reason. Right. Yeah. You know, and, and that's how si- opportunity systematically gets gets eliminated. Well, you know, something we've talked about is the lack of role models, especially that kids of color have. And, you know, there's such uh, stereotypes put on what kind of professions, you know, people of color tend to go in. Like Richard said, you know, you're either going to be an athlete or you're going to be in prison or you're going to be dead or you're going to be a rapper. You know, obviously there's more than that, but it's, it's kind of like a smaller box that a lot of people of color are put and said, okay, you're really probably only going to be one of these options. And so, you know, there's, there's a huge lack of role models for boys and girls to be able to see and look up to and be like, wow, I could be that. And I, I think what you're doing is incredible. And the, the people's lives that you are changing and, and the stuff that you are doing to change our communities and change this country is just phenomenal. And I think as a role model, I mean, you can't get much better than what you're doing with your life and, and what you can show that to young men and women who, you know, are growing up maybe in not the best environments or homes and struggling and say, you know, there, you can still be somebody. You know, there is still a way out of where you're at. You don't have to fall into the stereotypes that America gives you, that, you know, you can be better than this. And, um, you know, I I know life probably wasn't super easy with you. I know we didn't really get a chance to talk much about you growing up. And I know you had quite a few siblings as well. And, you know, can you just take a couple minutes, just kind of share a little bit about that and, and how you got to be where you are? Like, what were those pivotal moments in your youth or young adult life that said, made you think, you know, this is what I want to do with my life. This is the direction that I want to go and kind of how you got into deciding to be a lawyer and especially a civil rights lawyer at that. Because I think it's so valuable that people realize it is perception, right? Would they give us permission? When I say them, I mean white driven media in many ways. Mm -hmm. Would they give us permission to look at as role models is the athlete. Yeah. It is the musician. But there's, and, and, and this is not to belittle what you've done, James, because I'm so proud of you. It's right. remarkable. It is a testament to your work ethic, to your drive, to the support in your past. But James, you're not an anomaly. There are many right. of us as, as people of color right. that have succeeded as lawyers, that have succeeded as plumbers, doctors. that have succeeded as doctors, that have succeeded as, as sanitation workers. There are many of us that are successful. Even though right. we've had to sometimes overcome tremendous odds, yeah. we have done so, become successful, taken care of our families, um, gone out of our way to make sacrifices and so forth, and yet we're diminished in the public mm-hmm. eye to where we don't exist, Yeah. right? So right. talk about that a little bit too, because yes, there may be a perceived lack of role models, but we're here. Right. We're here. We're surviving. We're thriving. Mm-hmm. We need to Absolutely. make them evident. Absolutely. I, um, when my mother gave birth to me, she was 17 years old. My father had just been released from uh, Walla Walla State Penitentiary. Uh, My dad went on to have nine children by two other women. The conditions of my birth didn't necessarily lead to me or speak to me being a, a lawyer right now or anybody even asking me the questions mm-hmm. that you're asking me, frankly. Right. Um, at a certain age, I literally believe that all black men went to prison. And it wasn't because they had done anything wrong, but that, well, that was just kind of a natural course of what happened. Mm-hmm. Now, my grandfather was black and he had never gone to prison and he'd ever gone, also had graduated from college, but, um, there was a disconnect there, even though he was so special in my life, uh, in relation to whether, how it applied to him. 
Mm -hmm. I knew my father had gone to prison. I knew his 10 brothers or eight brothers had gone to prison, that his sisters had been in and out of jail. And um, my mother, my mother went back and got her GED, went to a community college, uh, did well there. And then in the 80s, uh, got into a special program at the University of Washington and was in student housing. And as a single parent, uh, sometimes you have to take on snow days your child to yeah. school with you at UW. I know mm -hmm. we've all seen that. Um, yeah. And I went to school with her uh, more than a few days and I met this man named Bruce Harrell. You know Bruce, I'm sure, mm -hmm. Husky yeah. hero city councilman, all those things, yes, 1970s Rose Bowls, all of that. And um, he befriended me and we've been friends for a lifetime. And the brothers there helped me to see and shift what my expectations would be in my life. Right around third or fourth grade, I started to believe that what was going to happen to me was that I was going to go to college. Didn't know how I was going to get there, so but good. I knew that I'd actually seen black men in classrooms there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Actually seen them. And the truth was, with some of them, I remember even asking, what are you doing here? <laughs> right? <laughs> now, this is real. Because I perception is reality. And her, mm -hmm. right? What are you doing here? Um, and, and each and every one treated me so well, you know, and, and helped me to understand what they were doing here. And they didn't just talk about their sports. And I'll never forget um, learning that Bruce Harrell had decided to pursue the law instead of the NFL. Mm -hmm. I'll never yeah. forget listening to that on the radio, I want to say as a fourth or fifth grader, and saying, that's that guy I sat next to in your classroom, mama. <laughs> he's going to be a what? What is that he's going to be? Right? right? He's going to be a lawyer? He's not going to go to that? You know, all of these sorts, mm -hmm. all of these things. And, and Powerful, um, man. that is the sort of difference because you start to move and shift and, mm -hmm. and be in a different space. And then as I got older along the way, I learned that my grandfather was actually a civil rights activist and all the things that that he had done and and uh, my grandmother had done some really amazing things. There's now a, a homeless shelter named after my grandmother called the Marion West in the U District over the things that they used to do. That's awesome. Um, yeah. And uh, and I started to, you know, move in a different way. And one of my uncles, my favorite uncle, my dad wasn't always around, but my uncle was on my mom's side was always around. And um, right around 14 or 15, he made this decision. Uh, and it was a surprising one. And it was to go to law school. And I remember being so mad at him because it meant he had to leave Seattle. And that meant that the guy that I would go on bike rides with and all that would be gone mm -hmm. for a while. Right. Um, but it shifted the world because again, now I'm like, okay, I'm gonna graduate from college, but I think that's the uncle I'm gonna choose to follow. I know I got a lot of uncles doing all kinds of things, but I think I'm gonna follow this uncle right here. That's wow. a hard right? choice, man. Um, and that's, that's ultimately um, the, route, the route that I chose, you know? And it's a... Uh, it's a thing where just modeling behavior on, mm -hmm. on a daily basis is why, why I end up wearing a suit a lot, even sometimes when I don't have to. Yeah, um, I respect just, it and I appreciate it. I, I would have done better if I'd have knew better. <laughs> no, 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 this is, this is a, a deep thing, but, but um, because I want people to re recognize what the possibility is. And I'm so good. And I am so concerned about the image of black fathers. And I know so many amazing black parents and black fathers yeah. that are dedicated to their children. So um, good, man. And I share a lot of pictures of my son on Facebook and otherwise. Um, but 
the reason I do it is because I want people to see them as human. I want them to see that, yes, we feed our kids. We make breakfast for them in the morning. I yeah. sit by them during his class or his school. He's, he's the literally the most important thing that I have on this particular planet yeah. um, to do. And mm -hmm. I'm hopeful that if we can, can elevate the conversation so that we all see each other's kids in our eyes, mm -hmm. we end yeah. up in a different sort of space because it's, it's harder, it's harder to point a gun at somebody's face when you see their children in their eyes and when you yeah. see your own kids in their eyes too. And when yeah. you recognize fully their humanity. So um, good, bro. And I think that that's a, just just that whole other part that that you mentioned and you talked about about wanting wanting to be a good dad and being so dedicated to just making sure that that i live up to my end of the bargain with my child and frankly with the children of others i i um uh i was a foster parent while in law school uh two of my brothers and uh that was why i chose to stay in seattle to go to law school was because they needed a place to be. And it was uh, it was frightening because everybody told me I couldn't do it, not with right. the case mode, not with all the things that you have to study. Um, yeah. But there was just part of me that, that, um, that hit me and said, ultimately, it's what you have to do. You don't know how you're gonna get through, but there have been mm -hmm. worse moments in time where you weren't sure how you were going to get through then either right so we're right. just going to have to make this work you yeah. know and every adversity that i've faced in my life has helped me to be a better lawyer um has helped me to better understand the nature and condition of of people even my experiences at the university of idaho uh, <laughs> um have i helped can imagine me, that <laughs> have helped me no it was it was uh quite amazing i mean I'll just tell you real quickly. I went to the University of Idaho. I signed my letter of intent at 17. I was the youngest kid on the team. I actually had to get a uh, um, a permission slip in order to play. Because at the time that we started Double Days, I was you were still, still 17. 17. Wow. And so I had to get a permission slip signed. Now, so, I'm, cu I'm curious, because you, you were recruited by USC, UW. Notre yeah. Dame, if I remember correctly. You, you go down the line. And um, you didn't have a GPA issue. So. Nope, nope. And my <laughs> How do you end up in Idaho? <laughs> <laughs> so, so I got into Idaho, and this is the question that, that folks asked me, including, including uh, Dick Bear. James, Idaho? The Oregon State Idaho? Yeah. Idaho? Yes, mm -hmm. Idaho. That's what happened. Vanderbilt. But, but my um, father had called me the night before, and I'll, I'll never forget it because he had said to me, whatever you do, don't go to the University of <laughs> Idaho. And I was just wow. kind of shook because I was like thinking in my head, whatever you do, make sure to be present through most of my life and give me more than one birthday present before I'm 18. Ooh. And mm -hmm. you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to sign with the University of <laughs> Idaho. 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 Okay. <laughs> It's a, it's a, yeah. So I, you're telling sure me, did. you're telling me that a that a successful lawyer changing the world, fighting for good. You had daddy <laughs> issues. I I absolutely did. I right. absolutely did. And and we still have so many things to work out. Uh, but I'll tell you right now at this moment that I love him dearly. So and powerful he's man. Very special to me. And upon coming back to Idaho, I actually lived with him. And um, and uh, for a couple of years while at the UW, and my um, my mom encouraged it actually mm -hmm. because she was like, "You got to give them some sort of some sort of grace." That's a right? powerful mom right there. Right. And so I, I did, and I, I got to know my brothers and sisters better, and and everybody of them were all so close. Um, uh, though my dad and I still were struggled at that time it was a little bit rocky but but it's it's um it's special now That's you know right. so, so many people as families um they don't realize that life don't have to be easy to be deeply in love with each other 
It's yeah. true. Life don't have to be easy for us to be a perfect family. Even in all our frailties, even in all our brokenness, and even all of our mistakes. Just keep loving each other. Just yeah. keep growing together and, and keep doing what you did, which is making that sacrifice to say, you know what? I ended up in a bad place. Yeah. <laughs> making a bad yeah. decision it was, it was based on cool. a bad history. <laughs> but I can change my life. Yeah. And and the, the reality is I learned so much about my father when I stayed with him. And yeah. I sat with his friends in the house and learned that when he was 17, he was in Walla Walla State Penitentiary. Mm -hmm. And he looked down the... Um, the cell blocks and all of his friends were in the same prison with him at that young age. It was the 60s, mm -hmm. right? And they all in unison looked at me as a college student at UW and said, and that's why we have a hard time understanding and raising you. And I think that was really real, you know, a, a really harsh reality. Uh, my father always told me that he got did five years over an MIP and I didn't totally believe him until I got to law school and I looked up his case and it actually went to the Supreme Court and it involved his brother actually having robbed a taxi cab driver and the police having his brother in the car and then he walks down the stairs because it's in front of his house and he says what are you doing with my brother and he's a little tipsy because he'd been drinking mm -hmm. beers and then they put him in the back seat too and then they drove him off he got yeah. represented by the same lawyer they both had the same lawyer and he was told if you say anything your brother is definitely going to get convicted but if you don't say anything maybe you both win so he chose not to say anything. Wow. And he got five years we go in to. prison. Wow. That's, that's a real talk. And I looked up the case once I was a lawyer and I didn't believe it until that moment. And my heart sank because, uh, and he readily admits there were a lot of things that weren't going well in his world and a lot of things that he had not, was not doing and maybe he would have ended up in prison at some point anyway. But that one right there that actually did it that wasn't real. Wasn't legit. That Jeez. wasn't legit. So I end up at the University of Idaho. And the first few days are going okay. On the third day, a player is taped up and beat up by the team as part of hazing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you know how things go. I'm supposed to sing a song right. at that night. And I wasn't the one taped and I wasn't the one beat up. And nobody to this point has heard me say a word. You know me, you know me mm -hmm. when I was younger. They're, they right. literally like not a single sentence, not a single mm -hmm. word, not even like cracked a smile or anything. And <laughs> You're so all I business. Stand up on that table. Yeah, all business. So I stand up on that table and there was something in me that just said, this is wrong. So I started to give a speech about how this is wrong, how it should never happen. So, and everybody's like, who is this 17 year old kid? I know that's going right. crazy on this table. And then finally they realize what I'm saying. The um, upperclassmen are like throwing pieces of paper at me. People are swearing. I put my middle fingers up in the air and I said, say, I don't care if I ever play in here. Boom, 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 boom. I jump off the table and I'm walking out the door. Three or four coaches are following me like, Mr. Bible, Mr. Bible. And then they stop because they're like, wow. He's really angry right now. We better not <laughs> We ain't gonna so mess with him. Yeah. So I'm walking down Main Street, Idaho, across from the little Moscow Mall, and oh it's starting to get dark. It's 1990, and I'm realizing the Aryan nations aren't too far from <laughs> they here. They so ain't. Yeah. And they're, they're loud and proud, and they say they want the state of Idaho for themselves. Yeah. You know, all of that sort of thing. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, I can't believe what, what's going on here. Um, and then I hear this voice, and it says, hey, Jim. Now, here's the truth in my life. There is only one human soul allowed to call me Jim mm -hmm. in the <laughs> world. Yeah. One. Mm -hmm. Nobody else does this or it's real trouble or at least back then it was real trouble. Mm -hmm. And that person, that one person 
never missed a football game I ever played in, never missed a basketball game I ever played in, regularly showed up at the, at my school, regularly checked in on me. Even when he could no longer drive, he caught the bus to wherever I was. And on that night, my grandfather had caught the, the uh, Greyhound bus to Idaho. <sighs> So he brings me, he, I go over into his Motel 6 and I'm giving my first closing argument. <laughs> and this is why I need a bus ticket home too. Why we ride this bad boy together. Yeah, like, I'm so glad you're here. Let me tell you about the system of injustice I have uncovered. Oh, come on. Let's oh my go. Gosh. And my grandfather from Mississippi, who at, at that time I didn't know that his full journey and all the things that he had been through raised his head and said I'm worried about you I'm proud of you mm. but I have to send you back and I'm like what are you talking about you have to send me back he said you have to live up to your responsibility man that's powerful. you signed your scholarship for a year You've taken the stand that you need to take and you have to face the fire because if you don't face the fire now, they'll only say that you ran and nothing will change. So good. So I'm worried about you because I love you, but I know what's right and you mm -hmm. have to go back. And here's the difference between him and my father because he's been there every time. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, okay, grandpa, I'm, I'm, a, I'm not feeling good about this, but right. I'm gonna go back, <laughs> right? So I go back into the athletic dorms late that night. I walk into my dorm room. My roommate is a little wide receiver from Idaho, a little white kid. He's like, you're going to get us killed tonight. And I was like, well, maybe so. But it's going to be so dark in this room that if they come in, uh, you're going to need to be swinged with me because I'm the only one going to have your back. So you might as well have mine. Right. So we put the little chair under the doorknob because I was like, that will give us more time. Oh, right? my goodness. They never came. Nobody ever came. Never, nobody ever came in. Nothing like that. Right. Um, but after practice the next day, the coach calls me into the office and he explained to me the nature of hazing and how, you know, it's just a fun thing and it's it's there's no racism involved. And mm -hmm. he started telling me about the different people that um, the different people <laughs> that they had done this sort of thing to each year and I was mm -hmm. smiling and I started to ask him more about what they did and it turned out that you know it wasn't a race issue and I had to say this but for the past for the four years that he went back every single player that they did that to was black there were only mm -hmm. 50 or 60 black people on the Moscow, Idaho, University of Idaho campus right. at the time, and all of them had athletic scholarship. It was uh, quite an amazing thing, yeah. but I got to tell you, the Idaho experience was a blessing as well, because it's also what helped me to be part of the NAACP. Yeah. And I never forget those words before I stand up at a podium or take a stance in relation to Manuel Ellis or Charlena Lyles or any other difficult case that it's time to face the fire. It's time to stand up. And the only way anything will actually change is if we do this. And there's going to be controversy and people are going to call me a racist or a hater or a person that just doesn't understand or isn't very smart or all of these different things. Right. And they're going to challenge what who I am as a human being and whether or not I actually care. Um, but the only way things are going to change is if we face the fire. So that's actually what I learned um, from the University of Idaho experience. And once I um, started this little group of, uh, and it was just me in the group, I called it a group, um, where I welcomed and welcome racists to come and meet and talk with me at the library about why they're racist. That's awesome. <laughs> no, I actually, this, this, this part actually happened. It actually did. And nobody ever came. So I just sat there with my little <laughs> 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 Oh my gosh. So, so 
I just sat there with my book, but I was That's like, great. if y'all were really about it, y'all would have come up and said, like, this is why I don't like you, bro. Right, yeah. for nobody, sure. Nobody did that. Nobody was ever like, oh, no, he's real crazy now. He's up here talking about, come see him. Oh, right. God. Long before the uh, the podcast, <laughs> Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man, you were ready for him. Yeah. <laughs> right there in the middle of Idaho. <laughs> Oh, wow. I, I think about it now, and it's funny because if my son were to do that, I'd be like, what are you doing? Yeah, let, let, let me, let's have a conversation. <laughs> I'm going to say it. Come on home. Come on home. Baby. We're going to yes. be okay. Just come on home. You know, That's funny, once yeah. my year was up, uh, you know, the reality is it was the Persian Gulf War. Somebody got hung on campus. They described oh, it as a suicide. The uh, person was half black, half Iraqi track student, and he was hanging from a tree. Oh. Um, so the world changed for uh, from uh, where it had been for Idaho, and Idaho was at, actually at the time a very good football team. Yeah. Um, but it was time to come home. I lived up to my responsibility and and uh, faced the fire and and did some things while I while I was there that I was pretty proud of. Yeah. Uh, though the seventeen year old kid did end up call, being called Big Brother X and all kinds of other things <laughs> by other players. <laughs> and they're like, what is James gonna say? And the funny thing is I really wasn't gonna say much after that. I just you know you said you know, it. Felt, felt compelled from my heart. And it was like boom, that was it. I was done. There we go. And then you find your way to the UW where That's Dick right. Baird I know is ex- uh, he, he, he did yeah. everything but try to sell the the the, <laughs> the uh, stadium for you. So to Dick have Baird you come was home. A, a great guy, and yeah, I, I came home and uh, my grandfather needed help, and I got to know my my uh, my father better. Uh, eventually, I, I I had a lot of fun running around with you guys. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, we and, did too. And uh, mirroring what what we thought the doing the. Um, what do you call it? Scout team, frankly, sometimes better than the uh, the yeah. other team could do themselves. Many times. Um, no, forget it. Often better than the other team mm-hmm. could do themselves. Yeah. You know? <laughs> um, and and it was just a real blessing. Um, but there were a lot of things happening in my father's home at the time. And at a certain point, I did move out and have one of my brothers with me while I was at UW. And then I had to make the very tough decision to move away again, go to Western Washington University, which was actually a a real safe haven for me and allowed me to grow and become the person that I am now in terms of um, becoming a lawyer, in terms of focusing on my grades, Mm -hmm. in in terms of just really growing uh, as a person and and ultimately feeling safe, you know? Yeah, so Um, powerful. There were a lot of wild things happening in and around the house that I was living at the time. Uh, while at the UW, I'd been shot at, not because of anything I'd done, but just because of where I was, where I was in terms right. of um, life, family members and other things. And it was just time to go. Uh, but I'm thankful for the whole breadth of the experience because with every turn, including like having sat in welfare offices trying to get food stamps when I'm trying to raise my two brothers while in law school. Um, That's incredible, me to man. to understand what my, my cl- some of my clients go through, you know? Right. Um, there's nothing like being s- sitting in, a, in a, a room for three and a half hours for somebody to, to tell you no when you're trying to find some way to take care of, of babies. Right. It's so powerful, man. Um, so I, I'm just thankful to be in this spot right now and and blessed. And uh, I, I was laughing and talking to another one of my colleagues um, today because um, and the reason why this person is my colleague is because we both know that we could say something and it could go completely a whole different direction and maybe we end up homeless. But we're in that tent city together. Fighting the fight. Still the same thing in the name of justice and human rights. Right? I ain't singing no song tonight. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly how it is. Which, by the way, I did sing a song later and it was Mr. Rogers, It's a Beautiful Day. 
the day and the day. Oh my god. I That's did beautiful. come back and do that week a week later or so. But you know I think that, Jesus that, loves me. That's about as complicated as I can get. <laughs> That's the faith we need to move on, right? Yes, and right. that's that's kind of just how I'm rolling. Is is uh, trying to do what I believe is right. Uh, I want to give people hope. I want kids to know that I have plenty of failures. Um, I have plenty of times where I absolutely was sure that I wasn't going to make it to be a lawyer, mm. or I wasn't going to be able to figure out how to pay for the next bill or work 35 hours a week um, at different points in high school, either at Little Caesars Pizza, Albertsons, Wendy's, um, or delivering a newspaper in the hilltop of Tacoma mm-hmm. in, um, in the late 80s. In duck and in a, run country. In duck and run, <laughs> in the middle of the night for the Seattle medium. That's where I know. I know now where you got all your moves from. Right. You know, we were quick, right? We had to shake. You, know? like, you got shook. That happened. I got to make it back to the band, bro. That's um, it. But yeah, so I, I mean, that's a a uh, a reality. You know, is is every step along the way there? There's been something, um, and it, it different points have been hard. I couldn't have made it this far without the luck of running into Bruce Harrell, without my mom taking the affirmative step of getting her GAD, GED, going to community college, going to UW, and then me actually meeting black faces in college, my, my uncle mm-hmm. making the decision um, to go away um, to law school, and, and then other folks in my world that really helped me with those possibilities. You know, so um, many of whom are still lifelong friends. The last time I talked to Bruce Harrell was probably about a month and a half ago. You know, um, we regularly talk. And yeah. and that is, I think, the difference is that I have a lot of people that help me grow, um, challenge my ideas and make sure that I know that that I, I'm special, too. And yeah. I think that we need to share that with a lot of folks and also um, find ways to give each other grace. And, and that's so one of the good, main man. things that I would like to convey in terms of um, black community, because there is tremendous pressure um, when you feel like you have to be perfect and you're carrying the mantle for everybody. And at yeah. work, you want to be two to three to four times better than everybody else because you don't want there to be any question in relation to whether or not you've earned what you've got. Mm-hmm. Um, is that we've got to find ways to give ourselves grace, um, ways to just breathe, smile yeah. in the world, feel better about things. I was um, a, a quiet kid, like like we talked about. I mean, people <laughs> people that know me now mm-hmm. can't imagine me then. Right. People that know me then are like. What happened? (laughs) (laughs) What happened? Um, But, you know, I I feel like somewhere along the way, I I actually found my voice and my comfort. And um, on some levels, my silence was eating me alive. You know what? Actually, I know what happened. I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you the (laughs) moment that my voice came to me. That's so important. I'm going to tell you. I was sitting in... After graduation, after that other job, I was trying to get another job. I was like always having like one or two jobs I was mm-hmm. trying to get another job. This was with a state juvenile correctional facility, and it was a, with a panel. And I was uh, feeling good. I was prepared. I had my grades were straight, like all my credentials, been a YMCA counselor for five years. All of those things. Solid. Yeah. And so I'm sitting in the interview and they start with Bible. That's a famous last name. And I smiled and I said, well, yes, it is. And I'm thinking about the book, Mm. right? Uh That's what I'm thinking about. Of course, they're talking about the book. That happens all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, And then one of them says, but that's not what we mean. And he looks at me. And he starts going down the line with all of my uncles that have been in the Washington State prison system. 
And then another one start, stops by saying that he was actually my dad's counselor while in prison. And so I try to stay focused and I talk about this is exactly why I should be in this spot mm -hmm. yeah. because I've been through that. I've had these family members that were in and out of the system. My father, it's true. He was in prison at that age. I've actually navigated these different things and I'm sure that I can help children grow to a better day. And I felt like I had a great interview. And then at the end of it, as I was leaving, my dad's counselor from prison walks out with me and he says a couple of things. Oh, first he told me a story. He told me a story about how somebody told my dad that he would be back. My dad punched him in the face, punched that person in the face. It was another uh, guard or something say he'd never be back. And then they brought him back for a day and then they released him later. Uh -huh. um, but then as we were walking out, this counselor tells me, you know, any questions you have about your dad, um, I'm happy to answer them. And I had to say to him that if my father wanted me to know all of his prison experience, he would have shared that with me. That's something that he gets to tell if he feels the need to. Mm -hmm. And I walked away from that, that meeting saying to myself, nobody will ever be able to hold all of that against me again in life. Come on. So good. I will share it. I will say it. I'll mm -hmm. say what happened, the good, the bad, the ugly, and I'll say this is who I am. But nobody will be able to be in a room and hold that my family members have been in prison or that my dad had been locked up or that any of my brothers and sisters had been in trouble or anything like that over my head in any sort James, of way. That's powerful, man. And so that was the moment, honestly, where I I think I started talking mm -hmm. because most people hadn't heard from me except for like short bursts on tables at the University of Idaho, <laughs> right? But after that, it was like, let's just go because um, I thought about my father, I thought about my uncles, I thought about the, the people that stood up for me. Um, <clears throat> and I thought about how they must feel walking through the world with people being able to say stuff about them at any moment about, well, we know what you did 30 years ago. Right. Yeah. You know? And so I was like, well, this, this is not going to be, be what, how this goes. And, um, and I think that was the moment. And on behalf of them, I, I mean, I remember one of my uncles who's, who's in prison now and has been in, in and out of prison his whole entire life. And I've got brothers, that had been in prison and a brother, like I said, that had died. But you know what? There was a day when me and one of my brothers were pissed off at somebody while I was in high school for one another or another reason. And we were mm -hmm. like, we're gonna go get him. And the person that stood at the door mm -hmm. was him. And he said, sure, go get him. But you have to make it through me first. And I've done so too many real. years already. And I'm gonna try to make sure that you don't do those same kind That's of years. So real, man. And we yeah. chose not to challenge that man. Um, and it wasn't just because we weren't sure if we could take him. It was because he, in his heart, in his soul, it was, it was present. It was, there was this universal truth that what he was fighting for meant more than the fiber of his being in terms of us. Yeah. So good. Right. So yeah. it's just one of those things where we're like, so that level of degradation by that panel that comment about these folks that that I've gr I had grown to love that love me unconditionally, um, and sitting through that meeting, thinking that it wasn't going to be about how I come from a family mm -hmm. of incarcerate of people that have been incarcerated before, um, and that it was just going to be about my academics, my merit, and how hard I try, um, led me to a place where. I will forever talk about this and I won't hide from that subject or any other. So powerful, Jim. Well, James, it has been such an honor truly having you 
on our podcast and being able to share your story with all of our viewers because, you know, we always talk about just getting the opportunity to share real life and the importance of people being able to hear stories just like yours and, you know, that you've had your ups and downs, you've had your struggles and where you are today making such an impact in people's lives and the communities and it's powerful and it's something that is desperately needed especially with everything going on in this country right now and you know i i'm actually kind of speechless <laughs> because it's you just truly have an incredible story and your your attitude towards life and your Excuse desire me. to help people is just refreshing and beautiful and you know, I, I don't even really know what to say. I, I, you know, for our viewers, I'll have James information um, for his uh, law group. It's the James Bible Law Group, and we'll have some contact information if any of you need to reach out to him. Um, you know, for the situation that maybe you could use his help in, um, or to run some stuff by him. We'll, we'll definitely include that in our description for you guys to be able to reach out uh, to James and. Uh, you know, again, I just I can't thank you enough for for doing this with us and um, just sharing your heart with us and with the viewers because it's just incredible. I definitely look forward to hearing more information on the Manuel Ellis situation and what you guys are doing with that because that's going to be incredible and impact so many people's lives and it's pretty amazing. So we'll we'll definitely update our viewers on some information with that as well. Thank you so much. There's uh, in this situation in the world that we live in, the climate that we live in, what you're doing is making such a big difference. Yeah. Um, and I commend you, bro. You are the same star that you were in, in high school and college and, and so forth. You have definitely made that leap, that transition from being a star on a football field to being a star in our communities and in the world that we live in. And if there's anything that you would like to leave with our audience, um, now's a great time uh, before we we uh, conclude just to share kind of your final thoughts with the Lionheart Institute podcast audience and and uh, such an honor to have you. Well, thank you for creating this environment where we can share our thoughts and feelings. And I think that ultimately um, it needs to be part of our mission to, to share and shed love and light, um, to see our children in the eyes of one another, to be in a yeah. space where we recognize so that we survive this together and we are the best uh, that we can possibly be when we root for one another and we root for goodness and we um, search for the best of people <laughs> and we seek to cultivate that no matter what their circumstances have been and we see um, uh, uh, room to grow and to breathe. I often think about um, the song Amazing Grace and its author and how he was actually a slave trader and right. recognized that what he was doing was wrong and mm -hmm. actually played such a dynamic role in terms of ending the slave trade. And, yeah. and if he can do that, then there's hope for a lot of other people too. Um, but so the same well grace that he's get, given as a slave trader needs to be given to my brothers and sisters that have sometimes yeah. found themselves on street corners because they're uh, capable of so much as well. So just so thank true. you both so much. Thank you. Definitely James, thank pleasure. you for being on the show, man. We this so is, appreciate you. Uh, my favorite conversation of the week. Oh, no. <laughs> thank you, well, God. we'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Everybody, thank you so much for tuning in to the Lionheart Institute podcast today. Our interview series is probably the thing that I'm most passionate about. Right. I enjoy telling the stories of young men and young women from our communities, people yeah. who have done so much to make a difference in the world that we're living in. I hope that you'll subscribe. I hope you be a part of what we've got going on. Mm -hmm. Please do comment, like, and try to share as much as you possibly can, James' story. Yeah. It is a remarkable story, not just because of the work that he's doing, but because of the man he is. And we didn't even really touch the uh, tip of the iceberg with him. Right, so uh, much more. <laughs> ten, 10 brothers and sisters, or he is one of 10 brothers <laughs> right. and sisters, and uh, had to raise two of his, his siblings um, later on in life. Just a remarkable story of the man mm -hmm. that he is. And so thank you so much. God bless you. I'm so excited about the future of uh, this, this podcast. God bless you.